Hello and welcome to Unacademy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. A very good morning and welcome to the Hindu analysis. So let's begin our discussion by first looking at the topics that we are going to discuss. So today from the international edition of the Hindu, I have chosen nine important articles for a detailed analysis. We have five articles that are relevant for the mains exam and few smaller articles that are important for the prelims examination. So let's analyze all these topics in complete detail so that you don't have to go back and read the newspaper again. If you guys are liking these initiatives, do support us with your comments, do press the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Before we begin, we have a very important announcement. To ensure that our IAS courses are affordable to all the aspirants, we are launching an Academy Civil Services Scholarship Test which will be conducted tomorrow on the 7th of April. This gives you a chance to win up to 90% scholarship on our IAS courses. So do register for the scholarship test by using the link provided in the video description. You can even contact us at the number provided over here and you also stand to win very attractive rewards as well. So do ensure you take up the scholarship test which also gives you an opportunity to practice the prelims questions which are up to UPSC standards. Uh, that are set by our expert faculties. So with this, let's begin with today's discussion by looking at this article from page number one. According to this article, India has abstained from UNHRC vote that was calling for an immediate ceasefire with regard to the ongoing Gaza war and was also calling for an arms embargo on Israel. So let's examine the context Let's understand why India has taken this particular decision and also look at the history of India's voting on Israel-Palestine question. All these discussions are very relevant for international relations uh, and we even have another article, a column in today's newspaper that deals with the same issue. So let's club both these topics and discuss this comprehensively. So if you look at the context, the context of the article is that India has abstained in yesterday's voting that took place at UNHRC or the UN Human Rights Council. At the UNHRC, a resolution had been moved by Pakistan on behalf of Organization for Islamic Cooperation or OIC. The OIC is an international organization that brings to brings together several countries with a significant Muslim population and it seeks to protect the interests of the Muslim community around the world. It acts as the voice of the Muslim world. So on behalf of OIC, Pakistan tabled this resolution at UNHRC criticizing Israel's alleged human rights violations in Gaza. The resolution was calling for an immediate halt to the war which is going on, an immediate ceasefire mandating Israel to end the conflict. It also called for an arms embargo, essentially a blockade on supply of arms and weapons to Israel, which it is using to target uh, Hamas and as well as uh, innocent Palestinians in Gaza. So in this UN vote at UNHRC, India has abstained on one particular resolution, but on three other related resolutions, we have voted against Israel. So that is why it becomes important to assess the balanced position that India always takes on the Israel-Palestine issue. So essentially, Pakistan had moved a total of four resolutions. On one of these resolutions, India has abstained from voting. On three other resolutions, India has voted against Israel. So let's understand what these re resolutions deal with. Why does India take such a complex position? And also let's understand a few basics about UNHRC as well, because you can anticipate a prelims question on UN Human Rights Council. I also want you to read more about OIC, Organization for Islamic Cooperation. I told you it's an international organization that represents the Muslim community of the world and brings various countries that have a significant Muslim population together. So please read more about OIC as well, because India does have certain issues with OIC, particularly 
with regard to how Pakistan misuses OIC. Pakistan often brings up the Kashmir issue and other internal issues of India to try and target India through OIC. It has been a concern for India. India also has tried to become a member of OIC because we have one of the world's largest Muslim population. If OIC represents the voice of the Muslim world and seeks to protect the interests of the Muslim community, then India has every right to be part of the grouping. In the past, India has tried as well for a membership at OIC, but every time Pakistan has blocked it because it uses the platform to target India and to internationalize the Kashmir issue. So Pakistan gets the support of few countries like Turkey, Malaysia and others who support Pakistan's position on Kashmir creating a challenge for India. So please read more about this organization as well. But I will give you some very important facts about UNHRC before we proceed to the discussion. The UN Human Rights Council, UNHRC was established in the year 2006. It replaced an earlier organization called the UN Commission on Human Rights. So previously, there was a UN body dealing with human, human rights called UN Commission on Human Rights. But due to certain controversies related to it, it was replaced by another organization, which is the UNHRC, the UN Human Rights Council. It's headquartered at Geneva in Switzerland. So the primary objective of UNHRC is to protect human rights. It includes basic human rights, gender rights, minority rights, LGBTQ rights. So all rights related to human rights are the mandate of UNHRC. So across UN members, UNHRC has this mandate to protect and promote human rights. So this UN body, which is a intergovernmental body, it consists of 47 member states. The composition is also very important. It co comprises of 47 countries which are elected for a three-year term by the other members of UN General Assembly. Please write down this point. UNHRC is made up of 47 UN member states who are elected for a three-year term and the election happens at UN General Assembly itself. So UNGA is a universal body, a representative body where all 193 member states are represented and the UNGA members elect 47 countries amongst themselves who represent the UNHRC. So there is a geographical representation here to elect these 47 countries. There is a geographical quota to ensure that every region is represented. For example, there are 13 seats that go to African countries, another 13 seats for the Asia Pacific group, six for East European countries, eight for Latin America and the Caribbean, and seven for European countries and the others. So as you can see, the developing and underdeveloped countries of the global south, they have a higher representation at UNHRC as compared to the developed Western countries. That is why the functioning of UNHRC and even its predecessor organization has been quite controversial. Quite often, the issue of human rights is misused for geopolitical games played between the developed global north countries and the developing global south countries. In fact, the previous organization, the UN Commission on Human Rights, it was heavily criticized for including certain countries which themselves had a questionable track record on human rights. For example, countries like Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Iran, which are known to be authoritarian countries, which are known to violate human rights themselves, have been elected and that has become a black mark on these organizations. There's also an allegation that both Global South and Global North countries misuse these platforms. They exploit the issue of human rights to play geopolitics to selectively target certain countries while conveniently ignoring the violations of their allies and friends. So as a result, the previous organization had become very controversial and it was replaced by UNHRC. But even with UNHRC, the same issue has persisted. For example, the US constantly backs and supports Israel irrespective of what it does against Palestinians. Even in the recent resolution pushed by Pakistan, the United States and few of its allies which stand with Israel, they have voted against the resolution 
meaning they have supported Israel, they have supported the ongoing Gaza war and they have not backed the call for an immediate ceasefire. This is quite contradictory because the United States at UN Security Council just few days ago had abstained from a similar vote and it had in a way given indirect support for a ceasefire. But at UNHRC where Israel stands accused of human rights violations against uh, Palestinian civilians, the US has protected Israel and it has voted against the resolution. So for India, voting on these complex issues has always been a diplomatic challenge. So this is where we have to understand India's history of uh, voting pattern when it comes to the Israel-Palestine question. And we should also look at the other issues on which India has voted and, and how has India voted on these other resolutions brought up by Pakistan. So if you look at the latest UNHRC vote that took place yesterday, a total of four resolutions were brought up by Pakistan. The first resolution called for an immediate ceasefire to the ongoing Gaza war, which essentially mandates Israel to stop the hostilities immediately. And the same resolution was calling for an arms embargo, a blockade of arms and weapons supplies to Israel. Because Israel relies heavily on the supply of arms and weapons from US and its European partners. That is what is fueling the war, which has led to more than 34,000 Palestinian casualties. So Israel on one hand stands accused of committing a genocide. Few countries like South Africa, Brazil and others, they have accused Israel of committing a genocide and they have even filed a case against Israel at the International Court of Justice. The ICJ is even examining whether Israel has committed a genocide against Palestinians. So at UNHRC, attempts have been made by the other countries to block the supply of arms and weapons to Israel and to mandate the imposition of an immediate ceasefire. So on this resolution, India has chosen to abstain along with Japan, France and other countries which often take a more balanced position on the Israel-Palestine question. Whereas US and some of its allies, they have supported Israel and they have voted against the resolution. But all the other countries, they have voted for the resolution that is against Israel. So now, if you look at the other three resolutions that were brought up by Pakistan, with regard to these resolutions, India has voted in favor. India has voted against Israel on the other three resolutions that Pakistan brought up. So which are these other three resolutions? One, with regard to human rights violations against Palestinians, where Israel stands accused of committing human rights violations against Palestinians, India has voted for the resolution, meaning India also believes that Israel has indeed committed large-scale gross human rights violations against Palestinian civilians. See, what happened last year on October 7th was indeed a dastardly act of terrorism. India condemned the act of terrorism as well and we stood with Israel as far as its right to defend against terrorism was concerned. But however, India has not supported Israel's disproportionate use of force. Not just now, even in the past, when similar uh, confrontations have happened between Israel and Hamas and Israel and other Palestinian extremist groups, Israel has often been accused of using excessive force or disproportionate force where it is known to slaughter and kill thousands of innocent Palestinian civilians as well. India has never supported this. Even in the past, we have condemned these Israeli actions and this position of India remains quite consistent. The Modi government has chosen to vote in favor of the resolution brought up by Pakistan. We have voted against Israel, which happens to be a key strategic partner. So this is a very nuanced, balanced position of India. On one hand, we are abstaining from the vote with regard to the ceasefire and the arms embargo so that Israel can decide for itself whether to continue the war or to call for a ceasefire. We don't want to interfere with regard to that. But on other issues where Israel is using excessive force, committing human rights violations, where Israel is in violation of basic international law through its continued occupation of the Golan Heights in Syria, and as far as the right of self-determination of Palestinians is concerned, Israel has taken away the right of self-determination from Palestinians. 
by never allowing Palestine to emerge as an independent sovereign nation. So on these issues, India has consistently voted against Israel. For example, if you look at the map here, you can see the Israeli occupied territories, not just the Palestinian territories of Gaza and West Bank, right? You can even see the Golan Heights present over here. It's actually Syrian territory, but captured by Israel and occupied by Israel since 1967, since the six day Arab Israeli war. Since 1967, Israel has occupied the Golan Heights and this is recognized internationally as a violation of international law and, and the UN Charter. India criticizes Israel for its continued occupation of uh, Palestinian land in West Bank, for example, and also the continued occupation of Golan Heights, which belongs to Syria. Now, for a map-based question in your prelims, Golan Heights can be very important. Please note down the other important locations here. You can see Lake Tiberias, also called the Sea of Galilee. It is present right next to the Golan Heights. It's located next to the Yormuk River. And you can also see Mount, Mount Hermon in the map if you observe closely. Right? These are important locations related to Golan Heights which might uh, appear as a map-based question. So, on the question of Israel's continued illegal occupation of Golan Heights, India has always voted against Israel. Even though Israel is a friend, a close strategic partner, we don't support the illegal occupation of Golan Heights. When it comes to the right of self-determination for Palestinians, India has always stood firm on this. It's an ideological stand India has taken since 1948. Since then, India has constantly backed the right of Palestinians to have their own country, which Israel has never allowed to happen. So on these resolutions, India will vote against Israel and it's a consistent position that we have maintained. But at the same time, when it comes to uh, Israel's right to defend itself against terrorism, when it comes to uh, Israel fighting against uh, extremist movements, which poses a threat to Israel as well, there India takes a more ba balanced position and we often abstain from those votes. So abstaining in itself is a choice. Don't think India is just sitting on the fence and it's not able to take a decision. The decision to not take a decision in itself is a, is a choice that India is making. That sends out a strong message that if Israel continues with these violations, tomorrow India might switch its position. India might vote against Israel. Or it's a message to the other side as well. That if terrorism doesn't stop against Israel, in the future India might switch position and favor Israel. So abstaining in itself is a is a big choice. Don't think it is indecisiveness. It's not. It's a balanced position that India is taking as far as the war is concerned. But with regard to violation of human rights, Israel's illegal occupation of territory and uh, the right of self-determination of Palestinians, India has consistently maintained support for the Palestinian cause. We can see this from 1947-1948 till date. It's quite a consistent position that India has maintained. Of course, initially when the two-state plan was proposed, India was against it. India was against communal uh, division and, and communalization of uh, the decolonization process. Right? India couldn't come to accept the creation of countries on communal lines because India itself was a victim of uh, communal partition. Right? But later, as Israel unilaterally declared independence and broke the two-state solution and snatched the right of Palestinians, Eventually, India came around to accept Israel as an as a independent state. But we didn't set up relations with Israel. That's another issue altogether. Due to our close ties with Arab countries and our dependency on Arab nations for oil supplies, we didn't want to antagonize the Arab states and we did not rec uh, set up official ties with Israel until 1992. But despite that, India has built very close relations in the last three decades with Israel while maintaining a consistent ideological support for the Palestinian cause. So whenever a vote comes up against Israel, as far as the right of Palestinians is concerned, even with regard to Israel's illegal occupation of territory, be it in West Bank or in Golan Heights, right, and also Israel's disproportionate use of force and human rights violations, we consistently vote against Israel and we take this principled ideological position where we support the Palestinians and and the other affected uh, communities in the region. That includes uh, the Syrian population as well in Golan Heights. 
but when it comes to the question of terrorism against Israel, right? So that is where India has has shown this position where we abstain from these votes in a way which extends support to Israel to fight against terrorism. Is that clear? In fact, the current government has brought out a much finer balance compared to before. The Modi government has been able to strike a better balance because previously India would, in most cases, vote against Israel, even though we had a, a close a partnership with Israel. But right now, India is is de-hyphenating the Israel-Palestine question and on certain critical issues like human rights, uh, violation of uh, uh, these basic international norms. We do vote against Israel, condemn Israeli actions as well, openly and publicly. But when it comes to Israel's right to defend itself against terrorism, we take a more balanced position by abstaining from these votes. So that is what we need to understand from India's position that has been taken at UNHRC. Now coming to a related column on page number six. The article is written by a top former Indian diplomat, Chinmaya R. Garekhan, who has been India's ambassador to the UN. He has been India's special envoy to West Asia as well, to the Middle East. So based on his incredible experience of dealing with the Israel-Palestine question, he's examining whether a Palestinian state will ever be created. Because in 1947, the commitment made by UN was for a two-state plan, a two-state solution to ensure that a Jewish state called Israel will parallelly thrive with uh, a Palestinian state for the Palestinian Arabs. Right? This seemed to be a viable plan back then which would protect the interests of both the Jewish community and the Palestinian community. As I said, India initially did not accept the two-state plan as it was a clear partition on communal lines. India rejected this because this land that you see here, which was part of British mandate following the uh, First World War, it was a Palestinian territory. Historically, thousands of years ago, Jews were present. They were driven out through historical wars and conflicts. But you can't seek to correct historical mistakes by, by introducing an outside population. So when an attempt was made by imperial powers led by Britain and US to create a Jewish state called Israel based on the promise they had made under Balfour Declaration. The British had made a commitment under the Balfour Declaration in 1917 that they would assist the Jews, particularly the radical Zionist movement to create a Jewish state in the middle of Palestine. So this was a clear violation of Palestinian rights. It would displace the Palestinian people from their native land. It was their native homeland. So eventually, as the Jewish settlers came in, it triggered large-scale communal riots between the Jews and the Palestinians. And the region was gripped by violence. It, it was gripped with violence in the late 1940s, after, especially after Second World War. The only viable plan was to create a two-state um, plan where both communities would get a separate country. Initially, India would not accept this, not just India, many other uh, former colonies, they would not accept this plan as it was a clear communal partition. It was a result of uh, imperial divisions that were being created. But eventually, that became the only viable plan. As Israel unilaterally declared independence in 1948 and Arab countries attacked Israel to protect Palestine and resulting in the first Arab-Israeli war and Palestinian uh, refugees were, were driven out from here and Israel occupied Palestinian land. It became the only viable option to ensure that the right of Palestinians was protected. So India did recognize Israel in 1950. Two years after Israel's independence, India did give recognition to Israel, but we did not set up ties with Israel because of uh, pressure from the Arab countries and our dependency on Arab nations. We wouldn't set up official ties with Israel until 1992. But our support for the Palestinian movement, our support for Palestinian people to have their own uh, independent sovereign nation has remained consistent throughout the last 70 odd years. So now the writer is questioning whether it's even viable to, to establish Palestine. Because given what Hamas has done, Hamas is this radical uh, extremist outfit, a Palestinian outfit operating in Gaza Strip, designated as a terrorist group by some countries. Israel, US and others have designated Hamas as a terrorist group. However, India hasn't. India officially has never designated Hamas as a terrorist organization. But some acts of Hamas has been labeled by India as acts of terrorism, like the attack on October 7th. 
So the current war which is going on was triggered by this attack on October 7, 2023. And Israel has gone in for a full assault to wipe out Hamas. So here the writer is examining the viability of creating Palestine in the midst of this conflict. Because the writer is examining the possibilities. Now let's say for example, let's say a ceasefire is somehow established. Israel is forced by the global community to halt the war. And let's say there is a discussion on, on creation of Palestine to protect Palestinian rights and even to safeguard Israel. Let's say down the line an election is held, a Palestinian election to determine as to who would administer the Palestinian uh, territories. That would result in a contest between Hamas, which is this extremist outfit, and the Fatah, which forms the Palestinian Authority. Palestinian Authority is currently the le recognized legitimate authority of the Palestinian people. It operates in West Bank and it's headquartered at Ramallah. So it's formed by another Palestinian party called Fatah, which is a secular and more moderate uh, faction amongst the Palestinians. If Hamas is an extremist radical entity, Fatah represents a more moderate and even a secular entity and it's acceptable to Israel and even to Western countries. So Palestinian Authority was established following the Oslo Accords of 1990s. Between 93 and 95, right? Israel negotiated with the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO which was until then an extremist organization and the PLO surrendered. It ended its, its terrorist war against Israel and the PLO was recognized as the legitimate Palestinian Authority. The PLO transformed itself into the Palestinian Authority and in subsequent elections it was the Fatah party, the moderate secular uh, Palestinian party which won the elections and it, it, it maintains control over West Bank. But in Gaza, Hamas has been the popular outfit. When the last elections were held here in 2006, it was Hamas which won the elections by defeating Fatah. So within the Palestinian community, there is a rift, a divide. And of late, support for Hamas has gone up, even in West Bank. Because Palestinians are, are disillusioned with the way Fatah and Palestinian Authority have been functioning. The Palestinian Authority is heavily criticized for being corrupt, for colluding with Israel and US, right? But for Israel and US, Fatah and Palestinian Authority are more acceptable. But for them, Hamas is a complete no-no. They, 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 they would never tolerate Hamas coming to power. So in the future, let's say, hypothetically, if you imagine a Palestinian state being created as for the two-state plan, and if a future election was to be held for uh, the Palestinian Authority, it appears as if Hamas is likely to win. Hamas has a lot of support in Gaza and its support in West Bank also has increased. So, in that scenario, Israel would never allow this election to happen. Israel would never allow a Palestinian state to be formed. Even the US would stand with Israel, thus snatching the right of Palestinians away. So, without defeating Hamas with, or without eliminating Hamas, there is no way that a Palestinian state can be created, according to the writer. The writer says that as long as Hamas remains active, right, as long as it engages in terrorism against Israel and Israel continues this war against Hamas, there is no scope for creation of Palestine and he believes that unfortunately the time has passed to even create Palestine in the future. He says it's unlikely to happen in the current circumstances. So eventually Palestinian people will suffer because of the extremism of Hamas and also due to the atrocities committed by Israel. See, there are no easy answers here. It's not a world of black and white. It's not about who's right, who's wrong. It's a grey area. It's a very complex question as well, right? Uh, beginning with the problems created by the Zionist movement, the imperial uh, intervention by Britain and US and later Palestinian extremism, right? Plus the regional uh, spread of this conflict, where several countries are backing uh, Palestinian extremism as a geopolitical uh, tool against Israel and Israel also retaliates. 
right so this has turned it into a very complex issue and india has always believed that only solution for this is to create palestine to set up palestine as a separate country and ensure it has a, a legitimate governing authority but if you examine the hypothetical scenario that if we create palestine tomorrow let's say all countries agree to it israel agrees to it and if elections have to be held if hamas has the popular support amongst palestinians if hamas is likely to win such an election israel would never allow that to happen right because hamas indeed has engaged in brutal acts of terrorism against israel the us would never allow it to ha happen right even india would find it difficult to accept hamas winning a possible election to the palestinian authority right and without a palestinian state this problem is likely to continue it's likely to perpetuate israel's atrocities will continue against palestinians so that is what the writer is pointing out that one hamas has to be neutralized second israel has to tone down its atrocities because imagine the worst case scenario what might happen right now right now things are getting so volatile that there is every possibility of this escalating into a bigger regional and global conflict i hope you know that iran and syria and lebanon the shia powers of the region they are backing few proxies to act against israel as a result of the regional rivalries that exist hamas which is the sunni extremist outfit operating in gaza a palestinian extremist outfit interestingly is backed by shia powers iran is the primary supporter sponsorer of hamas then there is another radical outfit called hezbollah which is a a shia extremist outfit operating in lebanon and syria all right recently israel carried out strikes against hezbollah and iranian targets in syria the iranian embassy the consular section of the iranian embassy in uh, damascus the capital of syria was recently targeted by israeli air force through air strikes in this attack many iranian intelligence operatives were killed because israel alleges that iranian intelligence the irgc is involved in supporting hezbollah hamas and other extremist groups including the houthis of yemen even the houthis operating from yemen have been backed by israel as one of its proxy to target israeli and american interests so just a few days ago israel carried out a major strike in syria where the iranian embassy was hit by a air strike specifically the consular section where iranian intelligence operatives were located so several iranian officials have been killed and now iran has sworn revenge against israel if not for a full fledged war iran is likely to retaliate iran syria along with hezbollah are going to retaliate against israel for what israel has now done so this could easily spill over and escalate into a bigger conflict and if it were to happen the us is likely to step in on the side of israel if us steps in and supports israel russia will not be left behind russia will not leave behind its allies iran and syria so there is every possibility of this escalating into a global conflict as well don't think that this is just some hypothetical scaremongering uh, situation it is a very real possibility as pointed out by chinmaya r gareka in the article the writer is saying that this scenario of a regional global escalation might seem like a uh, uh, a very futuristic prediction and a alarmist uh, viewpoint but he says that it's a very real possibility right so the only solution here is to create a viable palestinian state ensure that hamas is neutralized and a viable palestinian state is created which can live side by side with israel that can end this conflict forever but as of now in the given circumstances it's unlikely to happen and that is the concern of the writer he says palestinians may never realize their right given the current situation is that clear so that is what we take away from these important articles now let's look at the next column on page number 6 that's related to indian polity the article is written by two research scholars who are working as legislative assistants to members of parliament they are mainly exploring the role of the indian parliament in holding the executive accountable they are talking about the parliamentary tools that are available 
like uh, the various questions that can be raised uh, by MPs in the parliament, be it, uh, uh, let's say, a start question, unstart question, or the parliamentary motions that are available, like calling attention motion or adjournment motion, etc. These are parliamentary tools available to our legislators, to our MPs, which they can use on the floor of the house, in the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, to hold our executive, our elected government accountable. Now, this principle of parliamentary accountability, which is a constitutional feature as well, is what provides for a representative and accountable government in a constitutional democracy. But of late, there has been increasing concern about the parliament being involved in unnecessary uh, standoffs between the ruling party and the opposition. And it appears as if our MPs have lost interest in raising questions in pushing for uh, motions and discussions through which they were supposed to hold the government accountable. So the writers are presenting some data based on data provided by the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, depending on the number of questions that were asked, the number of discussions that were held, the number of motions that were admitted. They are comparing the productivity of 15th, 16th and 17th Lok Sabha. Recently, 17th Lok Sabha has concluded its last, its last session as we prepare for the upcoming general elections. So, the writers are pointing out that there is a disturbing trend that you can observe here. Please look at the graph. You can see the drastic drop, almost an exponential drop with regard to questions and discussions in the Rajya Sabha over the last uh, three, uh, three houses. Right, you look at the drop that happens here as well when it comes to, let's say, for example, calling attention motion, which is a parliamentary tool. Compared to 15th and 17th Lok Sabha, there is a significant drop which is happening uh, when it comes to calling attention motion. Within the Rajya Sabha, if you look at the terms of 15th, 16th and 17th Lok Sabhas during that period, that's in, basically in the last 15 years essentially, you can see a significant drop happening in the Rajya Sabha with regard to the questions and discussions that were raised by the MPs. So this is of great concern because essentially the government is getting away without enough questions being asked in the parliament on the floor of the house. The reason why we elect our representatives is to ensure that they represent us, they represent our constituencies and raise our concerns, our demands, our interests and question the government on the floor of the house and hold the government accountable. That is what a representative, de representative democracy stands for. But of late, there is a very serious concern that on one hand, the government is bulldozing uh, legislations through the parliament. The government itself is not allowing enough debates and discussions to take place. The speaker has often behaved in questionable manners, um, where the speaker who is supposed to be uh, politically neutral has often taken sides with the ruling party, not allowing questions to be raised, not allowing discussions to happen on the floor of the house. The opposition also has lost focus and it is not asking the right questions. The opposition has, has been sufficiently weakened allegedly by the ruling party, plus the opposition itself has been incapable of organizing itself and presenting a front, united front against the elected government. So this is great concern in the electoral democracy for the citizens, for the electorate. So here you should know about the different parliamentary tools of accountability that are available. For example, there is question R, right? In the Lok Sabha, the first R of every sitting, where questions can be posed to government ministers by the MPs. Then we have different types of questions that can be pushed. Different types of parliamentary questions, a start and unstart question, for example, right? A start question is marked with an asterisk. And this is a question for the minister, for the concerned minister. And in a start question, oral answers are to be given on the floor of the house. MPs can raise critical issues, issues of public importance. And this has to be raised with sufficient notice, obviously, so that the minister can prepare. So when speaker admits these questions, the notice is given to the concerned minister. And the ministry provides the information, the data based on which the minister formulates an answer. And on a fixed date, the minister will provide an oral answer on the floor of the house. And supplementary questions are allowed. MPs can raise related questions, thus holding the minister accountable, the government accountable on important issues. 
we also have unstarred questions. For unstarred questions, written answers are given by the concerned minister. So obviously, there is no option for supplementary questions here because it's a written answer which is given, right? But still, it will push the government to admit on the floor of the house and provide and share information which will bring transparency in administration. It will hold the government accountable. The government would be worried about being questioned in the parliament, right? So these are very important tools of parliamentary accountability. We have short notice questions, questions that can be raised with a short notice where oral answers are expected. We have half an hour discussion where on issues of critical importance, issues of public concern which require immediate, immediate attention, the members can push for a half an hour discussion and other proceedings will be set aside, time will be made, half an hour time will be set aside where a, de a debate, a discussion is allowed to take place. Right, where the concerned ministers are expected to give an answer and the opposition can raise questions and target the government and, and hold the government accountable. We also have important motions that are available like adjournment motion for example. Right, but it requires the support of at least 50 members of the house to be admitted by the speaker. The proceedings are prescribed in the rules of business uh, of the concerned house. And it's an extraordinary device because if adjournment motion is accepted, the business for the entire day is adjourned. No other business is taken up, no other bill, no other discussion is taken up and the whole slot is assigned for a discussion, for a discussion on a particular matter, a matter of urgent public importance. So important issues can be raised and the government can be held answerable right in front of the public. We also have calling attention motion where the MPs can call the attention of the minister to a certain important issue and raise questions on the floor of the house, expect answers from the concerned minister. So this is an entire Indian innovation in, in the parliamentary system. We also have something called zero R, right? Where these questions can be raised and the government can be held accountable. But the concern is the trend, the recent trend is very disturbing. Especially if you look at 16th and 17th Lok Sabha, the number of these questions and discussions have gone down considerably. The data is clearly showing that calling attention motions have seen an exponential decline. Even short duration uh, discussion and half, half, hour, half an hour discussion has gone down. The no number of questions that have been raised in the parliament has, has reduced by a significant margin. So this is of great concern according to the writers and they are urging the parliament to be more proactive. They are urging the opposition to get more involved in legislative business, in, in using these tools of accountability to hold the government accountable. They are urging the ruling party to respect parliamentary norms, to ensure that opposition is given a, a fair level playing field and it doesn't rush through bills and legislations and doesn't misuse the majority it has on the floor of the house. So that is what we take away from this important article. Now let's look at another important column on page number 7. This article deals with a social issue that is developing in Arunachal Pradesh. As you know, Arunachal Pradesh is a border state, a very sensitive uh, border state that borders Myanmar and China. Arunachal Pradesh shares a very important border with China and as well as Myanmar. So in Arunachal Pradesh, we have few indigenous communities. For example, the article is referring to the Yobin community. The article is specifically referring to the Yobins, also called the Lisu community. That's why the article is important. Yobins are also called the Lisu community. Now, who are the Yobins or the Lisu? They are a transboundary indigenous tribal community given the scheduled tribe status in India. In India, they have the ST status. They are a transboundary indigenous community found in India. They are also found in Myanmar and parts of Thailand as well. The community is distributed all across this region. So in Arunachal Pradesh, particularly in uh, the Vijayanagar region, which is close to the China-Myanmar border, it's a sensitive border region 
in the Changlang district. If you can observe the map given here, this is where the Changlang district is located. All right, the Vijayanagar region of Changlang district. So here you find this indigenous tribal community called Yobins or the Lisu community. They speak the Lisu language. Now this indigenous tribal community obviously has a certain degree of protection. As a scheduled tribe, their tribal land is protected. Their resources is protected. They enjoy few privileges as well. Like reservation, then uh, uh, government benefits in the form of scholarships, subsidies, etc. So all such benefits are given to the tribal community to protect these indigenous tribes. But the Yobin community is facing a concern. They have a concern with the outside settlers in the Changlang region. There are few outside communities that have settled in the Vijayanagar region of Arunachal Pradesh. Now, which are these outside uh, settler communities? Let's take a look. One, there are a number of ex-servicemen from Indian Army and Assam Rifles, which are involved in counter-insurgency, counter-terrorist operations in the Northeast. Assam Rifles is also responsible for guarding the India-Myanmar border. Right? So some of the ex-soldiers, the ex-paramilitary personnel from Assam Rifles, particularly the Gorkhas, After retiring from military service, many of them have settled down in Arunachal Pradesh. So the Gorkhas are opposed by the native tribe. They see them as outside settlers. There are few other outside communities as well here, such as the Chakmas and Hajongs, who came to India as refugees from East Pakistan. In 1960s, Pakistan was building the Kaptai Dam in East Pakistan, which led to the displacement of Chakmas and Hajongs. Plus, there was religious persecution as well against Chakmas and Hajongs because they are religious minorities. They were re religious minorities in East Pakistan. Chakmas are essentially Buddhists. Hajongs are Hindus. So these Chakmas and Hajongs who were driven out of East Pakistan because of Kaptai Dam construction, and religious persecution, they settled in India's Northeast as refugees. They have been fighting for citizenship as well. So those Chakmas and Hajongs who are settled here in Changlang district, they are seen as outside settlers by the native Yobin Lisu community. So there is a resentment between them. Then we also have few Tibetan refugees settled over here. There are few Tibetan Buddhist refugees who fled Tibet in 1959, who are settled in few Tibetan refugee camps in Arunachal Pradesh. So all these outside communities are seen as settler communities. Now any native tribe will resist the arrival of outside communities because they see them as a threat to their land, their identity, their resources, their customs, which includes their language, their culture, etc. So in Arunachal Pradesh, there is a system, in fact, across Northeast India, there is a system to protect such indigenous communities called ILP, Inner Line Permit, Inner Line Permit System. The Inner Line Permit is a colonial system introduced by uh, British India. It was introduced through the Bengal Eastern Frontier Regulation Act. The Bengal Eastern Frontier Regulation Act of 1873. This British law introduced a permit system in the Northeast region of India called ILP, Inner Line Permit. It's basically like a visa to enter these ILP regions. For example, if let's say we want to enter another country. As an Indian, let's say I want to go to Europe, I want to go to US. I would need a permit, which is nothing but a visa issued by those countries to enter that country. Right? That is with regard to external travel when you're crossing international borders. But within our country, 
there are few areas which are protected in a way, right? Particularly in the northeast, few tribal areas are protected. Where to enter this region, if you are an outsider, even if you are an Indian citizen, you need a permit, which is the inner line permit. Let's say you are from Delhi, you are from Rajasthan, you are from Karnataka. As a tourist or as a, a businessman, you want to enter, let's say, few parts of Nagaland or few parts of Manipur, few parts of Mizoram, few parts of Arunachal Pradesh, where ILP is implemented. You can't simply enter those areas. You need to get this permit. It's basically a travel permit for non-residents. It's a travel and residence permit which allows you to enter ILP areas and even reside there temporarily if you are a non-permanent resident. If you are not a permanent resident of this area, which means if you are not a uh, part of the indigenous community present here, right? Even to enter the region and even to reside here temporarily, you need this permit called ILP, Inner Line Permit. It is issued by the concerned state governments. Is that clear? So it is implemented in Arunachal Pradesh, in Nagaland. Recently, it was implemented in Manipur based on the demand of the Metis, the majority Meti community, in parts of Mizoram as well. All right. Now, don't get confused here with another permit system which is there in India called Protected Area Permit. That's a different permit system. You might have heard that in uh, Andaman Nicobar, for example, there are few islands inhabited by indigenous tribal groups like the Sentinelese, for example. So their entry for either Indians or even foreigners is restricted. Right. There are certain protected areas. Protected area permit mainly applies for foreigners actually when they are entering few sensitive areas. Be it tribal areas like the islands, the Sentinelese Islands in Andaman or even the border regions of India. If a foreign citizen has to enter these protected restricted areas, they need a protected area permit which is issued by the Home Ministry, Ministry of Home Affairs. All right. But for Indians, even Indian citizens from other parts of the country to enter uh, these tribal areas which are protected with ILP system, you need an inner line permit to enter and reside in those areas. So now the native Yobins in Arunachal who feel threatened by outside settlers, they are demanding for strict implementation of ILP system. They want guarantees for the protection of their land, their identity, their rights, their resources. So they have issues with the outside settlers. They see them as outsiders. So this is a sensitive issue, a social issue and a security issue which is developing in the Northeast. So that is what the article is exploring. Now moving on to the next column on page number 9. This is another important uh, article dealing with forest fires in India. It's specifically focused on forest fires in Kerala. But I think it's an opportunity to talk about forest fires in general. It's an important topic under environment ecology and also under disaster management under GS paper 3. So let's understand what causes a forest fire? What are the reasons behind forest fires? What is its impact? And how do you deal? How do you uh, mitigate the risk associated with forest fires? That is what we need to understand. See, forest fires can be caused by natural factors and also by anthropogenic causes. So forest fires basically can be natural, triggered naturally due to the elements of nature or it could be entirely man-made or a combination of the two where few man-made factors contribute along with uh, natural factors to trigger a forest fire. These forest fires are also called as wild fires. Essentially, these are large uncontrollable fires that consume our forests. They are very destructive. They destroy biodiversity. They contribute to large scale greenhouse gas emissions. They destroy the carbon sink, which is our forests. It's a threat to animals and birds and other species that inhabit this ecosystem. So forest fires, especially related to man-made factors, are extremely hazardous for the environment. If it's a natural forest fire, right, if it's a limited 
contained forest fire, it's actually good for regeneration of the forest. But because of anthropogenic causes, because of man-made factors, we have aggravated the risk behind forest fires. Climate change, global warming, and careless exploitation of our forests has resulted in man-made fire incidents, or at least fires triggered by man-made factors, which become these uncontrollable fires that consume thousands of hectares of forest land. For example, look at the deadly forest fires that we witness almost every year in the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. It is quite destructive. It, it causes significant uh, biodiversity damage in a very sensitive ecosystem. As you know, Western Ghats is a biodiversity hotspot. Even in Himalayan states like Uttarakhand, right? Even in Himachal, Kashmir, forest fires have been reported. Uttarakhand is a victim of forest fires where the forest ecosystem is affected. Biodiversity is affected by, because of uh, man-made factors and natural factors. And look at other global examples. Look at the recent massive forest fire in Australia a couple of years ago that caused widespread destruction across the Australian outback, killing millions of uh, animals and birds and, and other organisms. Also, look at the Amazonian uh, forest fire that happened a few years ago, which was largely man-made because of uh, uh, the policies of the Brazilian government under a right-wing government, under Jair Bolsonaro, who was the uh, president. He had allowed commercial exploitation of the Amazon, giving blatant licenses to, to def uh, carry out deforestation. And in the name of commercial exploitation, uh, this Brazilian government had allowed the massive destruction of Amazonian forest by setting fire to the Amazonian forest. Then look at California as well in the US. It's highly prone for forest fires. Some are natural, some are uh, triggered by man-made activities. So forest fires have become a global concern. It has become a, a, a byproduct of extreme weather events, which has been triggered by global warming. The long-term climate change, which has caused changes in uh, uh, temperature levels, which has caused changes in uh, rainfall patterns, Right? It's leading to adverse drought conditions, arid conditions. It's affecting all the biological, geological processes. And it is contributing to more frequent forest fires and more intense forest fires. It's one of the byproducts of extreme weather events. So the natural causes that can trigger a forest fire include lightning, volcanic eruptions, then alien species that might have entered an ecosystem from other outside uh, ecosystems, which could weaken the native ecosystem. So such alien species might enter naturally as well. But there are many man-made factors. For example, carelessly lit fires in forest areas. It could be by tourists who have negligently put up a, a campfire or a bonfire, who don't extinguish it properly. Or it could be a careless smoker who has uh, carelessly disposed a stub of cigarette without uh, extinguishing it properly. Or it could be locals, local villagers, local tribal communities. right? They might have set fire for, uh, for cooking or for clearing forest land. You might have heard of jhum cultivation, slash and burn cultivation, for example. right? In tribal belts, forested areas, hilly areas. These local communities, they are known to uh, clear forest land by setting fire and they keep moving to new farming land. Many times these forests, uh, you know, get consumed by the fires that are set. The fires could go out of hand. So it could be due to negligence, it could be due to over exploitation, over tourism. Large scale deforestation. Unplanned urbanization and industrialization. So all these man-made factors contribute to forest fires, right? And of course, long-term climate change and global warming. So this in combination with the natural factors can trigger these wildfires that destroy uh, the forest, the ecosystems, and it's very, very hazardous 
for biodiversity. Now the question is, what is its overall impact and what measures can be taken to mitigate and prevent this particular disaster? Of course, the first big impact is on biodiversity itself. There will be large scale habitat destruction. Uh, many threatened species could get killed, wiped out. The animals, birds which are dependent on the ecosystem, they could, they could all be eliminated. So there is huge impact on biodiversity. It will contribute to more emissions, pollution. Not only greenhouse gases are released, which could further contribute to global warming, creating a vicious cycle, but a lot of pollutants, particulate matter can be released that can cause significant air and water pollution, right? Plus, there is a huge economic impact and a social impact. The local business, local economy could suffer. The farmers could lose their livelihoods. Tourism could be affected. The livelihood related activities could be completely affected. This will in turn have a social impact, especially on the weaker sections, the marginalized classes like scheduled tribes, the forest dwelling uh, communities, etc. They will be the most affected. So forest fires have a deadly impact. They leave behind a devastation. And it's very important to not just mitigate the threat, but even prevent it. This is one disaster which can not only be mitigated, right? You can even prevent it. It's possible to prevent forest fires. If not all of them, at least few forest fires can be prevented. And through better planning, through better preparedness, you can ensure you mitigate or minimize, contain the impact of the disaster. So today we have very efficient pre-disaster planning and preparedness that can help us in mitigating and preventing forest fires. As part of the disaster management cycle, the first step is pre-disaster planning and preparedness. So we can use advanced technology to predict forest fires, to monitor forest fires in real time. For example, there are satellites today which can monitor and pick up forest fires in real time, provide you with real time data about forest fires that are getting triggered. And if you act accordingly, you can try to contain it within a small uh, radius. Even drones are finding a very big application when it comes to forest management. So satellites and drones, along with advanced weather forecasting, can help in preventing and mitigating the disaster. In the case of India, the IMD, India Meteorological Department, right, it can issue alerts regarding heat wave conditions, uh, any possibility of, you know, extreme high temperatures that could possibly uh, trigger a forest fire. So IMD does play a very big role as an early warning uh, institution, right? It can provide accurate early warning and forecasts. We can use advanced technology like satellites and drones for this purpose. And this gives us enough prior information to act quickly, to act on time and does prevent a, a forest fire or at least contain and mitigate the impact of a forest fire. Plus working with the local community will be very crucial. Local measures can be taken up, structural measures can be taken up by the officials, by the forest department especially, to prevent and contain forest fires. For example, by drawing fire lines. Have you heard of the term fire lines? Forest department, what it does is that it works with local communities and even uh, volunteer organizations and environmental organizations. They deliberately set fire to the forest even before the fire season begins, even before uh, the peak summer sets in. They clear out all the organic matter, the dried leaves and all the dried biomass that is readily available, which is the combustible substance. If you clear this off even before the fire begins, by setting deliberate controlled fires. So eventually when the summer season comes, when heat waves begin, you can contain the larger uncontrollable fires. You can prevent that from happening. 
you can bifurcate the forest area by drawing these fire lines by clearing the vegetation all right it it helps in keeping the fire within a certain uh, certain corridor of the forest while protecting the other corridors for example let's say let's say this is a forest area now if a fire starts in one corner and if this whole forest is one uh, ecosystem the forest fire might spread and consume the entire forest so instead if we draw fire lines for example if we fragment this habitat through controlled fires you set up controlled fires and create different segments in the forest right basically you clear a path for certain me few meters and draw these lines remove all the vegetation remove the grass the shrub and the dried material which are going to catch fire easily remove some trees as well if required so that it's a controlled way of uh, you know containing the fire so a fire which begins here in this section will not easily spread to the other sections thus protecting the other forest areas so creating fire lines setting controlled fires is a fire management technique used by forest department in collaboration with local community local community needs more awareness incentives as well to work with the government to work with the state agencies we will also need better fire fighting capabilities for example deploying helicopters and drones using bambi buckets you might have seen these visuals where uh, helicopters will have this large bucket a uh, shaped structure right which is suspended below they use that to pick up water from a nearby water body and they drop it over a, a forest fire or they use uh, advanced fire retardants as well which they spray uh, over these forested areas so such advanced fire fighting techniques are needed the usage of aircraft helicopters drones with bambi buckets and fire retardants can help in extinguishing and containing these fires so all these measures have to be taken and implemented and you can do this effectively only when there is planning and preparedness in the pre disaster phase before the disaster happens you can't wait for the forest fire to begin and then uh, plan for these measures right it requires extensive planning and preparedness and fortunately in india we do have a structured planning and preparedness with regard to forest fires the disaster management act and india's national disaster management policy and plan recognizes forest fire as a as a disaster and the concerned authorities be it the ndma the state level disaster management authorities the district level disaster management authorities they all work in coordination with the concerned stakeholders be it imd or uh, the state forest departments ministry of environment forest and climate change they all work with the local communities volunteer organizations to take these measures and implement them as well so that is the holistic a uh, response that is needed uh, as part of disaster management right through better planning and preparedness so we can mitigate forest fires and if possible prevent forest fires so this completes my detailed discussion of all the big articles today now let's head towards the prelim section on the front page itself we have an article referring to the monetary policy committee of the RBI and it's referring to a monetary policy tool called the repo rate so let's quickly understand what the monetary policy committee is and what is the repo rate see repo rate is the primary tool available with the central bank the rbi to control infl inflation and manage liquidity available in the economy repo rate is nothing but the rate at which the central bank lends money to the other banks or essentially it's the rate at which banks are borrowing from the rbi is that clear so by regulating repo rate rbi can manage liquidity and thus control inflation or promote growth depending on the macroeconomic conditions promoting growth and controlling inflation are contradictory objectives because to promote growth you need more liquidity so that easy cheap loans can be given out so in such cases repo rate is reduced so that the borrowing rate goes down and banks can give out cheaper loans which will drive businesses which will drive uh, credit and it will create 
growth and demand. But if this is excessive, if the demand uh, and supply uh, mismatch, if there is a mismatch between demand and supply, that will cause significant inflation. So excessive liquidity can also be bad because it can cause uh, runaway inflation. So it's important to maintain that balance. Sometimes liquidity will have to be absorbed. It will have to be sucked out from the system to ensure that inflation is within manageable limits. So the RBI has been given an inflation target. Is that clear? And a separate committee has been set up to monitor and manage inflation, which is the Monetary Policy Committee, MPC. It was established recently by amending the RBI Act. And it is headed by the RBI governor. RBI governor is the chairperson of Monetary Policy Committee. There are two other representatives from RBI. A deputy governor and another RBI board member is included. And the other three members are from, gov from the government. Other three are government representatives appointed by the finance ministry. So in total, there are six members who are part of Monetary Policy Committee with the governor of RBI being the, the chairperson. So this committee decides upon the monetary policy, decides upon repo rate. It has been given an inflation target of 4%. This is seen as an ideal inflation rate to promote growth while keeping inflation at manageable levels. But there is a flexibility given as well with a range of plus or minus 2%. So basically, the job of MPC, of RBI, is to keep India's inflation between 2% to 6%. 2% being the minimum, 6% being the maximum. And ideal target being 4%. So to achieve this inflation level, the MPC alters the repo rate. It's the primary tool, monetary tool available to contain liquidity to either introduce liquidity or to absorb excess liquidity. So in the recent Monetary Policy Committee meeting, it has been decided that repo rate will be retained at current levels. There is no change. Currently, it's at 6.5%. The same repo rate has been retained because RBI feels that food inflation remains very high and volatile in the economy. On the other hand, the industry, the government are pushing for growth. They want rates to be reduced. But Monetary Policy Committee has not agreed with it. It wants to retain the repo rate for now, given high levels of food inflation, which is affecting the common man. Next, we have a history-related article on page number five. According to the article, Raki Ghari findings are being included in NCRT history textbooks. And some other key topics, like references to Narmada Dam and few other controversial uh, uh, issues in India's post-independent history, those topics are being dropped. Whereas, Raki Gari findings fi a place, uh, finds a, a mention in the new NCRT history textbook. So let's focus on the Raki Gari findings or the Raki Gari uh, archaeological sites and understand why is it significant. See, Raki Gari is one of the most important Harappan sites to have been discovered. As part of the Indus Valley civilization, one of the most ancient uh, civilizations in the world, right? Raki Gari, which today is located in the Hisar district of Haryana on the outskirts of Delhi. This is a major archaeological excavation site discovered a few decades ago. Several important archaeological findings have been uh, discovered over here from uh, important fossils to important uh, uh, archaeological uh, evidence has been obtained that gives us an idea about the, the Indus Valley civilization and, and the Harappan civilization. It was located on the Gagar River plain and it was considered as the largest settlement at that point. It is seen as the largest Harappan site in the Indus Valley civilization. All right, But there are few historians, few archaeologists who disagree with it. Some say that they have evidence to show that it's a much more earlier settlement than even Indus Valley. They say they have found uh, archaeological evidence to show that Raki Gari findings, they are uh, predating the Indus Valley civilization as well. right? But it's not entirely proven. There is a, a controversy regarding this. But please note what kind of findings, archaeological findings have been discovered here. I have added the list over here from important 
archaeological evidences indicating advanced urban planning and township settlements to various artifacts related to seals, pottery, ornaments, semi-precious stones, and even uh, burial, burial and ritual uh, customs and practices, and even terracotta uh, artifacts. They've all been discovered here at Rakigari, which is one of the most important Harappan sites as part of Indus Valley civilization. Next, we have an article from page 11 related to economy, where the article is referring to a report by the IMF, which is the World Economic Outlook. This is all you have to understand from this article. The article is referring to India's GDP prediction and uh, IMF issuing a clarification saying that the 8% growth projection for India till 2047, which was reported by various uh, media outlets, right? IMF said it's not our prediction. IMF said we didn't predict that India will consistently grow at 8%. So that was a clarification issued by IMF. The article itself is not too relevant for us. But please focus on the report which is mentioned here in the article. The World Economic Outlook is a very important report brought out by the International Monetary Fund. Now coming to the last article for today on page 13, there's an article referring to the issue related to Kosovo. So let's quickly talk about this. Kosovo is a breakaway region in the Balkan um, region of Europe. The Balkan region is where the Balkan mountains are present in Southeast Europe. You can see the map here, right? So this essentially is considered as the Balkan region. The Southeastern part of Europe, where you have countries like Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia. This is where Kosovo is located, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Albania, etc. These are the Balkan states, all right? And also the term Balkanization, you might have heard about it. It refers to the breaking up of one state or one country into many different constituent states or countries. The process of Balkanization, right? It, it comes from here because one large region was broken to create multiple states. So the breaking up of a large state or a country into many different countries is also colloquially referred to as Balkanization. The term comes from here, from this region. So this is where the Balkan mountains are found and Kosovo is the breakaway region. All right. It fought against Serbia. Previously, it was part of Serbia. Uh, if you look at the history of Serbia and Kosovo, there is a brutal history here. Back in 1990s, there was a violent conflict that took place over here. See, in Serbia, which is a European country, a Balkan country, the majority community, the majority ethnic group are the Serbs. But they had differences with minority ethnic groups like Albanians, right? So in the southern part of Serbia, that included Kosovo back then, the Albians, they led a separatist movement. They took up arms against Serbia, triggering an ethnic insurgency. And it led to a brutal conflict where even NATO was involved. NATO also got involved and joined the war here back in 1999 and a very violent, bloody conflict was fought in this region. And eventually, by 2008, Kosovo declared itself to be independent. With support from uh, NATO and European powers and, and few other countries, the separatists in Kosovo, the Albanian separatists and the ethnic groups, they declared that Kosovo is now an independent nation. But this claim is not recognized by every country. So Kosovo is not a UN member yet. It's not an independent country as such, but some countries recognize Kosovo's independence and it is striving for international recognition. Serbia rejects the independence of Kosovo. Obviously, it's a breakaway region which has broken away from Serbia. But European Union is warming up to Kosovo and it's on the potential list for membership. It's already getting closer to the, uh, to the Schengen zone. Right? Recently, it has been brought on board uh, with regard to uh, the Schengen passport control zone, where Kosovans can travel to the Schengen area without uh, visas. And it's, it's about to become a full-time member as well of the Schengen area. Right? right? As of now, only air connectivity is being considered. Down the line, you never know even 
uh, across the land movement or across land border movement could also be considered. And eventually, Kosovo is looking at EU membership. It wants to become an EU member with support from European Union, thus seeking international recognition for itself. So the article is referring to a national census which will be conducted, which is the first time since it declared independence. And this census will establish the demography of Kosovo. So in Kosovo, you have majority Albanians, right? And there are other minority groups. The Serbs are in minority here. But Kosovo has promised that everyone will be treated equal. So with the support of EU, it is planning to conduct a census to bring out the demography of Kosovo. And it's on the potential list for membership to the European Union as well. So just knowing where these countries are located, these regions are located, and understanding the basic history of the conflict is more than enough because there can be a basic prelims question or a map-based question on Serbia, on the Balkan region, or on Kosovo itself. So this completes my detailed discussion of today's The Hindu Newspaper. Please take a look at the two mains practice questions. You can pause the screen, take a screenshot, or write down the questions. It's all based on what we have studied earlier. If you can use those points that I mentioned, and in the same order, if you can build a structure for your answer, that is more than sufficient. So please use them for your answer writing practice and post your answers in the comment section below. So this completes my discussion for today. I hope you guys have liked it. I hope you have understood everything. If you did, please press the like, like button and do subscribe to our channel. That is it. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Have a great weekend.